Hi everyone, this is Sean Blackwell from BipolarAwakenings.com and today I'm going to give you guys a presentation that I served up in a webinar a couple of months ago. I call it Innovations in Healing Bipolar Disorder and it's really a summary of everything that I've learned in working with people with bipolar disorder over the last seven years. So let's go. Okay, first we're going to talk a little bit about the background to the healing work. Uh, we're going to talk about Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat that's something I've created. The techniques for liberating trauma that we've used on that retreat. Uh, discovery we made along the way. Retreat results and the innovations we've done for 2020. Okay, so a little background. 13 years and counting, you know, together with my wife, Leisha Splendori, we began studying the relationship between the concept of spiritual emergency and bipolar disorder in 2007. That's when we started. And with my YouTube channel, Bipolar Waking Up, I spoke with hundreds of people online who had had spiritual experiences and received a psychiatric diagnosis. Here's a picture of me from my first video when I had a lot more hair. And my first question was, you know, am I bipolar or waking up? Of course, I knew I'd had a spiritual emergency. It was more of a provocative, provocative question. But what I got back was a lot of feedback from people about the spiritual dimension of their apparent acute psychosis in bipolar one, right? Um, what I was doing at that time, I wasn't just gathering information, I was also comparing the experiences of people online with the theories of pioneering psychiatrists and psychologists like Dr. Stanislav Grof, who helped me understand my condition or my experience, Dr. David Luf Lukoff, who's written a lot about spiritual emergency, Dr. Lauren Mosher and Dr. John Weir Perry, both of whom had clinics in the late 70s where they help people work through their initial experiences in acute psychosis with the recognition that um, those experiences were an intended reorganization of the psyche. So their work was very important. And based on all this work and research, I started making a lot of videos really covering every aspect of bipolar disorder you could think of, what causes it, the triggers, hallucinations, why you think you're Jesus, wide range of experiences. Okay, in the end I made over 60 videos in English, 3 million views, translated into six languages. And then in 2011, I wrote my book, which really details my story. And this sort of became my resume for people if they really wanted to get to know me, my background, and, and how I got into this work. But that's not all I was doing during that time. Between 2007 and 2009, Lesia and I worked with five people in mania or psychosis without meds. We were really trying to model the Soteria House where people would come in and they would just support them by being with them and not doing something to them, you know. And um, it worked out a little bit. We had some success. But in the end, that model proved to be chaotic, confrontational, and unsustainable because basically the families in psychiatry were completely against what we were doing. And we were sort of taking at that time a bit of an anti-psychiatry, anti-medication attitude and trying to work the way we were. It just wasn't working out. We realized we needed at that time an integral approach. And what we meant by that was we needed to look at what was great about the peer support movement, which is largely anti-psychiatry, treating people in a non-hierarchical way, okay? Um, reminding them that I was in the hospital too. We brought the theory of transpersonal psychology, which was very important. We looked at the healing aspect in spirituality and we recognized the needs that people had for being on medication sometimes from psychiatry. So peer support, psychology, spirituality, and psychiatry were all part of our new program. That's what I meant by an integral approach. And we also had an underlying assumption for our new approach, uh, which was that in order to heal a disorder, that the underlying trauma needed to be released. Now, trauma is not a difficult experience. It's the emotional dimension of experience which has not been expressed, okay? It's sort of what's been walled off and blocked off in the subconscious. But where exactly is the trauma? If you look at the medical model, you know, science cannot find trauma anywhere in the person's brain or body. It's something that is undetectable. And so we realized we needed a new approach, and this came from transpersonal psychology, this transpersonal model. Here's the artwork of Alex Gray, where we recognize that, okay, there's this meat and bones human being, but there's also this whole soul system. You could call it a bioenergetic system or a chakra system, and that this is where we could work the trauma. We recognize that trauma was held in blockages in this bioenergetic system and that a safe, emotionally supportive environment was necessary to access this system. 
So we came up with the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat, and this was our methodology. First, an intensive, personalized retreat, ideally of 10 days. We had a structured, focused format for doing deep healing work with people in a grounded state. We needed a safe location away from the city where the neighbors wouldn't be bothered by noise. And each client needed to have a trusted supporter. So we could do this basically in any location as long as these four criteria were met. It was dead simple, really. And then on the retreat, what we were doing, we were using techniques for liberating trauma. And the main one was a derivative of holotropic breath work called bipolar breath work, which I basically created. So here's a little scene where you can see a holotropic breathwork facilitator and the person getting ready to breathe. That's not me, obviously. Um, but let's look at holotropic breathwork for a second. First, it was created by Stan and Christina Groff in the 1970s. It's a technique for liberating trauma using voluntary over-breathing. And holotropic means moving in the direction of wholeness. Okay, And the client is invited to express their inner experience without any sort of repression during holotropic breathwork. This technique has the capacity to release physical tension, life trauma, perinatal trauma, or birth trauma, repressed emotions like anger, sadness, fear, and joy, sexual repression, and even spiritual energies of a divine or demonic nature. Now the healing agent is this inner healer. This is something that Stan Groff identified, a divine loving intelligence, okay? And there's always a facilitator involved to help the client surrender and flow with this sacred process, which opens up once people start to accelerate their breathing. I was certified in 2016 by Groff Transpersonal Training, and I've got a short video here just to show you an idea of what holotropic breath work can look like. The people in the video you're about to see are experienced breathers, so they really get into it. And this video is done by a German holotropic breathwork facilitator named Klaus John. Okay, here's a little clip from his video. So what you'll see in holotropic breathwork is people starting to breathe deeply and aggressively, but at their own rhythm. And then going with the music you might hear right now, people start to just trust their intuition. Sometimes involuntary tremors come up. I uh, hear a woman's working through an asthma condition. Here a guy is going through deep stress, releasing deep stress, and you just sort of glow, go with the flow of the music and whatever arises in your intuition. Sometimes the trained facilitator needs to do body work on a person. Uh, here releasing some tension in the jaw, for example. Here uh, sexual experience is coming up. You can have a wide range of experiences coming up with a breather. You can have some deep physical intuitions to stretch, states of ecstasy, and sometimes people want physical contact, and in the end, they'll do mandalas to sort of express what they went through internally during the session, and everybody survives in the end. All right, there's Klaus John, he's the creator of the film. So now that you've seen the video, you can think, great, I'll just go do holotropic breath work and resolve my bipolar disorder. But it wasn't so easy because the majority of facilitators would not work with people diagnosed with mental disorders. It was determined by Stan Groff that the group um, environment and the limited time frame wasn't enough in case people really access some really dark and disturbing material. It may disturb the group and the person may need more support than was available in the typical breath work setting. Okay. But then I started to think, well, what if we did this on a healing retreat, in a healing retreat situation privately? So we created a plan for the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat. We adapted holotropic breathwork for people with bipolar disorder and called it bipolar breathwork. In this way, it's always done with direct facilitator support, not in a group. We allow clients to stop the process whenever they want. They don't continue for the full three hours like they do in holotropic breathwork. And we give them much more mattress space and protection for the client than a couple of yoga mats with sort of restricted, restricted space. Okay, those are a few of the adaptations we've done. Okay, uh, and in this way, bipolar breath work is done almost every day of a retreat, and we've encountered only minor problems. Here's the retreat house we have in Brazil. This is a place that really gives us a five-star experience. It's a hotel that normally uh, is rented out to 20 people. And they have a private facility for holotropic breath work with, as you can see, plenty of mattress space, pillow space. And this room is really done specifically for uh, holotropic breath work, and in my case, bipolar breath work. Okay, this is down here in Brazil. If anyone wants to come, all right.
And we also did other activities, as you saw in the video, mandala drawing, meditation, talk therapy, leisure activities like being by the pool, going for nature walks, this kind of thing would happen on the retreat as well. Right? And on the retreats, we made an amazing discovery. We had a problem to start. Most clients can do more than 20 hours of bipolar breath work across 10 days. So that meant basically two hours a day. So there was a lot of downtime. And in addition, the facilitator and supporters may be absorbing energies from the client, which could lead to exhaustion. And that was really my case. You know, I was regularly inundated with nightmares. If the client was working through sadness, my nightmares would be full of sadness. If it was anger, my nightmares would be full of anger. And this would happen every retreat. And it was so bad that I would start to feel like I was covered in charcoal. And in certain cases, long rest periods were needed for me to recover. I'd have to take a day off in the middle of the retreat just to discharge this energy through meditation, you know. So this was a bit of an obstacle that I was struggling with for a number of years. But then we found a solution. Together with Monica Kettler, who was my second client and someone who supported many other clients on other retreats, we discovered that by doing breath work with the client, we could further accelerate the healing process. So we actually had a situation where I was facilitating and Moni, who was also absorbing energies, would breathe alongside the client and she started working through the client's materials, right? We could breathe the client's materials. This was a huge breakthrough and we called this approach surrogate breath work. Surrogate meaning doing it on behalf of, like, like you may have heard of a surrogate mother. Signs of a surrogate connection. How do we know that the, the surrogate breather was working through the client's material? Well, they would have deep insights into major client's issues. They'd have complementary physical sensations and movements. So if the, with the eyes closed, if the client was moving in this direction, the surrogate would move that way as well. That would happen sometimes. And they would have this sort of synchronistic movement happening even if they didn't see each other. Uh, the sense of these experiences not being related to the life of the surrogate, but to the client. So you just, the client, the surrogate would feel like they were working through their issues, you know, or the, the issues of the client. And then there would be strong emotional experiences expressed by the surrogate, screaming, crying, singing, growling, whereas the client was having a quieter experience, okay? So can you guess which mandala was drawn by the surrogate? Here's the one on the left and the one on the right. Obviously, someone's going through quite a pleasant experience and the surrogate was going through hell, okay? It's specifically on this retreat. So here's a picture of Moni that she's drawn where she's sort of in this energetic connection with the client. As it turns out, this inner healer that Groff talks about is actually a healing field. And that healing field can send material to anybody involved who's prepared to take it on. So now having a surrogate breath worker is now a standard part of all retreats. And this represents a st significant step forward from Groff's Holotrip of Breathwork principles, to say the least. And down here in Brazil, it's usually me that's working as a surrogate, and we hire somebody else to do the facilitation. Right. Now let's look at retreat results. Um, what happened to people when they're on retreats? And, and these are sort of informal results that I've sort of calculated in talking to people over the years. Okay. Um, between 2013 and 2019, we did 49 retreats with 34 clients. 12 had two or more retreats, and they were conducted in seven countries, uh, France, Finland, Germany, Romania, U.S., Mexico, Brazil. We worked with 19 people with bipolar 1, 2, depression, 4, schizoaffective, schizophrenia, OCD, dissociation, borderline, undiagnosed, and a few people just did it for personal development reasons. And we were working with a wide variety of people just to see what was possible, you know, what, what this retreat format had potential for. Uh, most of the retreats were my, nine days or more, 22 of them. Some were six to eight days, 20, and then a few um, three to five days. The feedback we got was mostly positive. 39 retreats sort of got positive feedback. Eight had negative feedback, a couple of neutral. And uh, the asterisk is there because the feedback was negative in the short term for a few people, but positive in the long term. So they walked away feeling a little uncomfortable with what happened. But then a year later, or even two years later, they would come back with really positive feedback, right? And then to show how weird things could be, three of the negative feedbacks we got were on second retreats for people. It's just, for whatever reason, things didn't go the way they did in the first retreat. They might have hit some difficult material, and we didn't really get at it the way I would have liked to. Here's a summary of some of the good stuff. 
Now, it's been recommended by Groff Transpersonal Training after I got my certification with them. They've indicated people with bipolar disorder to come and uh, do the retreat with me. Eight clients are currently no longer using psychiatric medication, but six of them had a second retreat. So it shows that, you know, we make great progress in 10 days, but to cure a lifetime of trauma and the ego adjustments that go along with it, sometimes or quite often extra retreats are necessary. Okay, and even though people didn't go off their medications entirely, many have reported an improvement in general well-being, feeling more authentic, open, and alive, confident, less fearful, grounded in the body, uh, long-held issues have been resolved, uh, reporting the return of blocked abuse-related memories, you know, like sex abuse, which can be a, an often blocked memory, has surfaced for people, and a wider, healthy, emotional range in daily grounded life, you know. So all this was great stuff for people, and often people with these characteristics could reduce their medications to some degree. Nobody has entered into psychosis during the retreat, and that's more than 250 breathwork sessions, and clients with bipolar disorder have responded very well. Psychiatric medications have not had a negative impact, which is really encouraging. Okay? And as far as surrogate breathwork goes, it's really been a breakthrough in efficiency. My first retreat in 2013, we did eight breathwork hours by the client across 20 days, okay? Um, so it was like very slow going in a sense. With the surrogate, we could do 42 breathwork hours in seven days. That meant 16 breathwork hours for the client, plus 14 by the surrogate, breathing simultaneously, and then afterwards extra hours for myself and the surrogate, usually Moni, in what we call clear out sessions to really empty that energy out completely. More good stuff. Uh, some clients have gone public with their stories. Here is Tim Canote. He's from the Netherlands and he has gone public in newspaper, radio, and on television, television interviews, talking about his experience on retreat with us. And now he's been without medications for two years. So he's been one of our great success stories, and he's really taken up the work as something he wants to do for his life, right? Kirsten Ogard, as well, my third client, wrote an article on her healing from schizophrenia in Madden America. And Monica Kettler wrote How I Healed My Bipolar Disorder as well, which has been a, a very well-received story. It's got over 50,000 views. Okay, but there were a few limitations. The results are more immediate and obvious for people with milder disorders and those with more maturity. So it was important to ensure that clients had realistic expectations. Some thought I was like a magic guru who's going to make their problems go away. That was not going to happen, right? And it was expensive. You know, the approach, even though I was basically making minimum wage considering I was with people for 24 hours a day, once you included the flights and the hotels, everything got to be a bit much, you know. So we needed to keep exploring the effectiveness and efficiency regarding these techniques. The other thing was that travel can be risky as well. I mean, international travel can be a big trigger. And for me personally, I was working illegally in Europe, so I needed to find something that I could do here in Brazil. If you're interested in learning more about the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat, you can listen to an interview that I did with uh, Will Hall, on Madden America, Sean Blackwell, Breathwork for Bipolar and Psychosis. Very interesting interview. Will came down here and uh, actually participated in, a, in our breathwork process as well. It was very interesting. Okay. So just to recap until now, um, what are the innovations? Well, we started with holotropic breathwork, which we couldn't do with people with bipolar disorder. We changed that to bipolar breathwork. And then the surrogate breathwork came in, which was a big step forward. But we still had more to go. Innovations for 220. Well, the first was something we call distance surrogate breath work. The healing field, as it turns out, is non-local, which means it doesn't travel across time and space. It's a little bit like the internet. It's everywhere, okay? That meant that it turned out that I could work through clients' energies on my own in my apartment, if you can believe that. And I started testing that distance surrogate breath work throughout 2019 with clients from around the world. And basically the methodology was that we'd set a time for the client and myself to be open and connected in the spirit of the work. I'd play a two hour music set and then the clients would lay on their bed at home in a more receptive state for one hour or more so that they could be sensitive to what's going on with them. Um, they did not do the breath work. They just breathed naturally. I would be doing breath work on my side. And actually I wasn't even breathing that much too. I could just sort of go into the process quite easily now 
as I've had over 300 sessions. My experiences in DSB were similar to those working live, tremors and tensions, sadness and anger, dark or demonic energies, birth material, the client's essence, the client at their best is something I would feel as well, detail of family life and private life, um, that would come up, a sense of peace, and also linking information, little tiny things that would let people know that my experience that I was having was related to them. So in one of my last experiences, what came to me was a vision of espresso coffee in a little tiny cup. And it turned out that my American client was actually a big fan of espresso, had the little tiny cups, and was just amazed that I would know this about her. Then after the session, what would happen with the methodology is I'd leave a voice record recording dealing my experiences in the session. The clients may have experiences as well, so they would um, talk about what happened with them on their side. And then we would talk, we would share experiences the next day. Okay. The benefits of distance surrogate breath work, it really had zero risk. Clients reported feeling more open, lighter, and relaxed after sessions. They never entered difficult or dangerous material. Conducted once a week, integration was more gentle and easier to manage than a regular retreat. Fees for the first session were returned for unsatisfied clients. If people didn't feel that this worked for them or, or they didn't resonate, I just returned their fee. Um, and this way there was really no risk for people giving it a try. It was also a great value because it was priced lower than standard talk therapy. And for 2020, a two-hour session is $150, and that's less than 2% of a full retreat. Um, so it was a great deal, you know, especially compared to what I was doing before. So along with distance surrogate breath work, we came up with something called conscious emotional clearing, CEC. You see, what happened was distance surrogate breath work was opening clients to previously blocked emotions and memories, which would happen after a few sessions sometimes. And the conscious emotional clearing help people work through this material on their own or with support. What it does is it relies heavily on pre-verbal vocalization and of conscious feelings, not the unconscious feelings of the breath work, as well as physical expression. And the great news was that conscious emotional clearing could be used at home to work through triggered emotional content. After one coaching session, some clients have been able to use it without additional support at their own home. And then other clients have found more success having me participate in the CEC sessions regularly. Okay? They can sort of borrow on my sense of presence. So together, this distant surrogate breathwork, DSB, and conscious emotional clearing, CEC, they created an interesting therapeutic combination which appears to have plenty of potential. Basically, they're two sides of the same coin. You know, What we're working on with DSB is material that's really unconscious. It's sort of not something you're aware of, but then working on that unconscious material on my side would bring up certain conscious material on your side that you could work through. And so that's why we would use the CEC to work on this part. So it was like DSB, CEC. They seem to make a great combination. Okay, so just to recap, like I said, we started with holotropic breathwork, then bipolar breathwork, then surrogate breathwork, then distance surrogate breathwork, then conscious emotional clearing. We've really come a long way in seven years. We've innovated a lot. I'm sure there's more innovation to come. I'm really excited about these new processes, and people seem to be making great progress with them as well. So that's about it. If you enjoyed my presentation, please check out my website at bipolarawakenings.com, and I hope to see you there. Bye-bye.